Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Patrick McFadden and Rachel Podreski. Good morning, everybody! I like the enthusiasm. <laughs> Cassandra Summit 2015. There are more people in this room than I knew used Cassandra. That's amazing. I'm kidding. How's everyone doing this morning? Really good? Yeah. Wait a minute. How come I'm up here alone? Where's Rachel? Uh, she just left me hanging. Okay. All right. Well, all right. We'll just keep going. All right. So first thing we're going to do this morning is a riveting live demo, right? And uh, let's bring up the uh, the demo here. So. I have a couple of data centers here. This is going to be really awesome. Um, those are Raspberry Pis running uh, Cassandra. They're really, really running Cassandra. So I have data center two over here, data center one over here, killer video. Anybody know about killer video? Oh, yeah. We're going to dig into it. We're going to do a code dive. We're going to see how it works. It's amazing. And we're having it running right now. And I have a status page up here that shows all the nodes running, You know, something you might see in a plasma in your, in your uh, in your data center or something like that. But it's just showing how the thing is running, right? But I'm doing this alone, All right? Where the hell is Rachel at? I mean, she should be here. Well, I'll just keep going. Oh, okay, I, so. Sorry, 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 sorry. The Rachel. It was late. I said There's 10. traffic. 10. And, and I had to get coffee. Coffee. And, ooh, you made clock. nodes. Ooh, yeah, I made fantastic. Uh, what? Ah! Oh, jeez. Oh. Ah! Oh, oh, Rachel. Oh. Rachel, what are oh. you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Hold on. You just spilled coffee. I built this. It took like a whole weekend. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This is why we can't have nice things. I, I'm so sorry. But, but, but the app's still running. We, we, oh. we can still do our demo. Well, all right, yeah, well, it's Cassandra. It could do that, right? Yeah, but. Why are you so late? Uh, well, I had coffee. Yeah, well, all right, that's um, not an excuse. But there was this tornado on right, 101. This is going to show up on your and... performance review, OK? Tornado, <laughs> really? Oh, wait. This tells me, there's a good story. All right. Did I ever tell you the time I had a tornado that hit a data center? Yes, you've told me about the time. You've oh, I it was amazing. Every, but how, who else is here about the time that this uh, tornado hit Patrick's data center? It looked just like that. Oh, wow, there was a tornado. Oh, it was. And you know what was really amazing? It took everything apart. And it kind of looked like this, right? So uh, there was like a blender type tornado. And it, Do you really so, uh, bring a blender to conferences? Oh, well, yeah, uh, it's a blend tech. It's really nice. But, oh, like, will it blend, right? Yeah. So when the tornado hits and you don't even know, it takes like a node and puts it in here, right? What's going to happen, right? Oh, it's just... Like a tornado, right? Oh, no. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think Billy's going to like this. What do you guys I, think? I, like, smoothie? Yeah? Low? No, no, no. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. Just. All right. Uh... Ready? <laughs> Oh, that, uh, hang on. Oh, that's just everywhere. Careful, don't Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. That's really bad. Oh. There we go. Not the way I expected. Oh. Whoa, that's bad. That's really, really bad. All right, one more time. You know, this is the gods of. <laughs> oh. There it goes. Oh. 
Yeah, I think that's done. I think that's done. Nice, ni nice job. Uh, you know, sometimes, oh no. Oh. It's a chaos monkey. <laughs> You know, some of our customers Christoph, do this on purpose. What and are you doing with these wait guys? Wait a minute. Hold on. No, 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 no. Hey, bad monkey. What are you doing? No, no. Bad, bad. Oh. No. Ah! Oh! No. Hey, put that down. Put that down. What are you doing? Oh. He cut the network cable on purpose. This is why we don't get, shouldn't give out free passes. You don't know who comes to these things. That is not what I. Oh, hold on. Why is there a monkey over there now? What are you doing? Bad monkey. You are a bad monkey. Don't do that. Don't touch that. Oh, no, 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 bad. Go, go, go. What? He's go, got a cigar. Go, go, what are you doing? No, no. There's no smoking in there. Ugh. Oh, my oh. God. Now we got a fire. Oh, okay. Wow. okay. All right, I know how to handle this. I'm a first responder. I know how to deal with this. Okay, hold on. All right. Okay. Put my hat. Okay. All right. Fire axe. All right, fire axe. Okay. I know how to handle this. Stand back. You have a fire axe? I have a fire axe. Here we go. No, no, right. no I, I don't think it's ready. I don't think it's ready. <laughs> I think it's out now. Well, I think we caused a mess. How's our demo running? Oh. Still on? What? Wow. There's a couple things. There's only running. three nodes left. You know what? <laughs> Let's just trash this thing. I think Let's it's a go. good idea. Go for it. All right. All right, I think it's good now. I'm, I'm never going to be late again, I promise. <sighs> well, it got out of control, didn't it? Just a little bit. A little out of control. OK, well, <sighs> wow, we completely destroyed it. Oh my gosh, we did. <laughs> oh, OK, well, nice that job. got really out of control fast. Um, you, you know, maybe we should pick better data centers? Thanks, guys. That was nice. That was nice. They're making fun of us now that we destroy everything. So, all right, I guess what we're going to try to show is that Cassandra's awesome, but it's not awesome enough to just destroy everything, is it? No, I guess if you actually have, you know. A couple of nodes. Yeah. Yeah. You're still all right. You should have at least one node, but I think we killed everything. I'm, I'm really feeling bad about this. This was not what we expected to do. We were hoping to do a demo of the we application. We had a really nice code dive and an IDE to show you guys. It was going to be really great. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is what you're going to hope for whenever you're in your data center is whenever you know, bad things happen and things fall apart all over the place that it's still running, right? And, or if you have chaos monkeys that you deploy on Ladies purpose. and gentlemen, please welcome Billy Bosworth, uh -oh. CEO, Datastax. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. All right. Yeah. Time for uh, a little bit of adult supervision. Uh, the real fire marshal has asked that you guys cease and desist from all of your so-called demo activities. Appreciate you destroying the room and trashing everything we have uh, in front of us right now. But on a serious note, thank you for the very visceral experience around what, what the life can be like in the real world. But Patrick, you come from a background where you've managed these systems in production, and you've seen, you really have seen a lot of crazy stuff. And I know one of your companies, the, the hopes and dreams of young people hinged on a click. And if that click went through, good things happened. If it didn't, the next four five years of their life were altered. But there's some truth Despite. to this demo, isn't there? Right, and despite a tornado, uh, that actually happened. Um, <laughs> but I mean, this is, this is what we needed because it was mission critical. And when I think of mission critical, it could be anything from a heartbeat, monitoring a heartbeat, to something as trivial as a cat video. But it doesn't matter. Your application is the critical part. And if you're in the 21st century, down is dead. You cannot survive with downtime. And you can't survive with slow. And you know, because you're here, that Cassandra's that database that can deliver this. If it's on a little cheap Raspberry Pi, I don't recommend that. But you definitely want to use it in your data center because of what it can do for you. Well, great. Well, Rachel, Patrick, thank you so much. Can we give them a big round of applause for the <laughs> kicking us off with a great demo? <laughs> and hopefully no more gorillas will be, will be making their way out on the scene. So I want to welcome all of you, this massive crowd, to a great 2015 Cassandra Summit. It is really a privilege to have all of you here today and uh, to see what's going to be in store. 
About one year ago exactly, I stood on stage at our Cassandra Summit of 2014, and we celebrated something that was changing in the Cassandra community. And that was a departure from the rugged pioneers of the earliest days into a new class of user, into a new class of customer, into somebody who was maybe not used to living in the bowels of these open source projects, but they were bringing to light new activities and new applications and new ideas coming from a mainstream audience. And I predicted at that time that the creators of this new universe of ours were going to be you. You were going to be the authors of a new way of life. And the expansion process was going to occur. And you were going to hold the power of authoring this new future. And I predicted that the expansion would start to happen pretty quickly after last year's event. But I was actually a little wrong on that one because the expansion has happened so much quicker than I think even we would have imagined. It has been a spectacular thing to watch us go beyond plank time for, for you nerdy ones in the audience and into the inflationary period. We're watching this stuff grow at an incredible rate. A few statistics from last year's conference. We came and we had over 2,600 people decided to join us on site to register to come to the event. We had more than 1,000 people who watched via streaming video selected portions of the conference. And we had 60 sessions that were created for you and by you. And that was remarkable because it wasn't too long before that, when we were having conferences with 20, 25 sessions, and we were calling you the week before saying, hey, can you present? We need a few more sessions to get filled. Well, that's all changing very radically. In fact, I, I want you to do something, not, not too weird. I won't ask you to get up and hug anybody or anything like that, but stretch out a little bit because I do want to ask for a show of hands on something. If you did not attend, if you did not attend last year's summit, can you raise your hand really high for me? Look around the room. Did anybody attend last year? It looks like maybe nobody did. That's remarkable. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming this year and being a part of this. Let's put those numbers in statistics for this year's conference and think about where we are today. More than 6,100 people tried to get here today by registering. We had to, for the first time in our history, stop the registrations. We're out of space. The, the, the real fire marshal, not Patrick with the hat, but the real fire marshal said we can't have any more people in here. So we had to actually stop the registration process. More than 5,000 people are going to be watching this event online. I think it's going to be far more than that, actually. That's a, that's a conservative number. And we're streaming more pieces than we ever have before. But you want to know the real mind-blowing part to me? Look at the number of sessions. 137 sessions over the next two days. Five months ago, our community team, who is responsible for shepherding the process, Datastax does not decide which sessions get presented. That's a very democratic process that you all vote on. But we do shepherd that procedure. And about five months ago, the team walked into my office with a binder about that thick. And I said, what's that? And they said, these are our abstract submissions. That's never, ever happened, where we have had that many submissions that early in the process that ended up leaving, unfortunately, some unhappy people because we just didn't have the room. In the future, we will. I can't even imagine what these numbers are going to be as we go forward. But this is incredible in one year's time. Most companies don't even make it this far in the size of a conference throughout their entire life. And to watch this happen, happening and unfolding right in front of our eyes and having you be a part of it is just remarkable. So in case it's not obvious to you yet, you have chosen wisely. <laughs> Investing your career. Thank you for the three applause. That's right. <laughs>
You have chosen wisely. Making these choices with your energy and talent is a non-trivial exercise. So you are making a bet. And you're making a bet with the most important thing you have in life, your time. That's something we all have in common, and you are choosing a technology that is special. But what makes it so special? It does some amazing things, but a lot of software does amazing things. I think what's different about Cassandra it, it, is that it is foundational. It's bedrock. And when you have a technology like that, that's not an ancillary technology, but a foundational technology, all of a sudden, you can build upon it in amazing and incredible ways. You, you can build applications. You can build your career. And you can build entire companies on this technology. At Datastax, we are very privileged to be so integrated and intertwined with this technology. We have our offering called Datastax Enterprise that we are very delighted to bring people world-class support and enterprise functionality and features and very easy to use tools. That's great and exciting and it's a privilege to do that for our customers. But for us, that's just the beginning. That's just the foundation. And for you in your world, in your applications, in your companies, it's probably much the same. You see this technology as a bedrock foundation, and then you can start to free your mind to think very differently about how you build applications and service customers and bring context to transactions, whether it's with technologies like Spark or Solar or in memory or a variety of other things. How can you take those ancillary technologies, plug them into this bedrock foundation, and then do things in new and interesting ways? I think the best way to really understand that is to hear from people who live this every day. At Datastax, we have a community team. They're called evangelists. And you are their audience. They live to be passionate about you, about how to bring you the wisdom and knowledge and education and examples to help this community grow and to learn from you and to bring it all together. Two of our best are John Haddad and Luke Tillman. They've done lots of really good creative work to make examples for people to learn from and understand how do you think about building a modern transaction? How is it different from the way things used to be? Is it more difficult? Is it easier? Is it different? And hearing from them directly, I think will help us all gain a, a very tactile understanding of what some of this future can be. So would you please join me in welcoming to the stage John and Luke. Thank you very much, Billy. Uh, as Billy mentioned, I am Luke Tillman. And I'm John Haddad. And we are technical evangelists for Datastax. So before John and I joined Datastax, believe it or not, uh, <clears throat> we were actually responsible for putting things in production. So before we started living this sort of glamorous life of evangelists, uh, they actually let us write code and put things into production. That's right. And it's important to us that we continue to understand what that's like. We're talking about provisioning servers in the cloud, we're talking about reading documentation, understanding how things work, and we're also talking about writing code. There's only one way that we can continue to understand this. We have to keep building things. So you saw it in the earlier demo. We decided to build something called KillerVideo.com. And Killer Video is a video sharing web application, and it's powered by Datastax Enterprise and Microsoft Azure. So if you go to KillerVideo.com, that's Killer Video without an E, uh, you will find links to, well, you'll find not only the live demo, but you'll find links to things like the source code, the CQL schema, as well as a whole bunch of other resources to help you get started building your own applications on top of Apache Cassandra. Now, when we first started building some of the basic features on the site, uh, most of them were just kind of core Cassandra and CQL. So for example, this list of the most recent videos on the site that's on the home page is just a really simple time series data model and a CQL query to show it. Now, what if we want to build something a little bit more complex? What if we want to build something like a personalized recommendation engine? Uh, you've probably seen recommendation engines before. Maybe you've bought something at an online store. 
uh, and you've gotten other things that maybe you'd be interested in buying, or maybe you rated a movie highly on Netflix and you got recommendations to watch other movies that are very similar. Now, we could try and build something like this from scratch, but it turns out it's really hard to do at scale. So instead, we're going to go ahead and leverage Spark. So if you haven't heard of Apache Spark before, you're going to hear a lot about it uh, over the next couple of days. And so Apache Spark is just a framework for doing distributed computing. And we spend a lot of time at Datastax making sure that Spark works well, not only with open source Cassandra, but we've also taken and integrated it into Datastax Enterprise. And so with our recommendation engine, instead of building it from scratch, we're going to leverage one of Spark's machine learning algorithms called alternating least squares. Yep. And so the way this works is we take users, like Luke and I, and we take videos, like this cat burrito thing, and then we take our ratings. And we basically feed them into this algorithm. And this is process is called training. And then what happens is we get this thing called a model. A model lets us get recommendations for people based on the movies that other people have already seen and liked that have in common uh, traits with me. And this is really cool. And we're going to take the predictions that we get out of this algorithm, and we're going to store them in Cassandra so that we can show them on the home page. So this is really, really cool. But that's not the coolest thing about this. The thing that's amazing is that we managed to build this in less than a day and under 100 lines of code. Now, that's absolutely unbelievable. This is something that would have been ludicrously hard just a few years ago. And now anyone in the room can do this. Okay? You don't need a team of PhDs uh, in machine learning to be able to do this. Hey, Luke. Do you have a PhD? I do not have a PhD. Do you have a PhD? I don't have a PhD. <laughs> so what's really cool about this, as Luke mentioned, this is an open source project. It's Apache Spark. But it's also baked right into DSE, and it's really great and easy to use. So another part of DSE that we lean pretty heavily on in the killer video demo is DSE search. So when users add videos to our catalog, we ask them to provide tags, which are essentially just keywords that describe the content of the video that they're adding to the site. Yep. But it's really not enough to just ask people to tag everything and be, only be able to search on those tags. Users expect that they can do things like search on the title, they can search on the description, other metadata that's available. And so to do that, what we've done is we've leveraged uh, the search feature built into DSE as well. So if you've never seen this before, uh, this is what it looks like to turn on search on our videos table in Killer Video. It's just a single uh, line from the command line. And once we have this turned on, we can start sending solar queries to Cassandra. And if you've never seen solar query syntax before, this is what it looks like to send a simple query for Cassandra in the description of a video. And one of the cool things about DSE search is that DSC, uh, that solar querying is baked right into CQL, the query language for Cassandra. So when I want to send this search to Cassandra, I can actually do a CQL query that looks something like this. And I'm also not just limited to simple stuff, like simple queries like this one where uh, we do Cassandra in the description. Because we're based on Apache Solar, we have all sort of the power and the flexibility of the Solar project behind us. So when somebody actually uses the search box on Killer Video, we really send a query over that looks something like this to DSE. And one of the things that's really amazing about this, similar to the work that we've already looked at with Spark, is this wasn't particularly difficult. In fact, this took only a couple of hours and maybe was about 20 lines of code in order to get the search functionality. Uh, that's pretty cool. You don't need a team of search experts in order to add uh, search to your site that's already backed by Cassandra. Hey, Luke, are you a search expert? I am not a search expert, John. Are you a search expert? I'm actually kind of a search expert. <laughs> yeah, you're a search expert. <laughs> yeah. So. What have we learned here? Hopefully, we all taken away that adding these features, which used to be really complex and used to be really hard, can now be added in a trivial amount of time. This is absolutely amazing. We no longer have to choose between a scalable operational data store and one that's easy to use. And it's also really great to see all these awesome open source projects integrated so tightly with Apache Cassandra. Yep. And furthermore, the last stage of the game, the thing that I'm really excited about, is cloud providers like Azure make it really easy to deploy our apps into production without having to buy a bunch of really expensive hardware. Thank you all very much. Uh, have an awesome Cassandra conference. Thanks. 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 Great job. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, John and Luke. That was uh, awesome. Thank you for giving us a little deeper dive into that technology. Hopefully, in an audience of this size, some of you, at least, are as old as I am. And you remember the heady days of something we used to call internet development. And when we were doing our internet development, we were looking at all kind of new technologies. 
and trying to figure out how this new world was going to sort out. And you probably remember the day when you first took a look at something called ASP.NET. Anybody remember those days? Come on, you got to be that old. All right, we got some old timers in here. Let these elderly people go out first when, when, the, when we're when exiting the airplane. So Scott Guthrie was one of my uh, early heroes, actually, because I was a developer back in those days, and he was a co-creator of that ASP.NET technology. Uh, rumor has it that the prototype was developed in a, in a room over a weekend uh, with his co-creator, which may or may not be true. But Scott has been really marked by innovation throughout his entire career. And today, as EVP of Microsoft's incredibly important cloud and enterprise business, he is continuing to push that innovation, but he's doing so now in a world where we're bringing it into the mainstream. And so I've gotten to know Scott a little bit over the past year as our partnership has developed, and he is an amazing uh, individual. So would you please join me in welcoming to the stage Scott Guthrie. Scott. So Scott, welcome, first of all. Thanks a bunch for having me. It's great to be here. Great. I see you went with the red shirt today. Yeah, that's my standard. Unusual choice for <laughs> Scott, for those that don't know. Uh, the red shirt is something he has been characterized by for how many? How long now? How many years? I just don't have any good dress sense, so I just okay. wear the same shirt over and over Keep again. Keep it simple. <laughs> it's easy that way. So Scott, you, you still work for Microsoft, I assume. Yep. Uh, this audience is largely going to be very open source oriented, very Linux oriented. Uh, there's a lot of them. Are you in the right place? Are you sure you meant to be at this conference? I hope so. Uh, okay, so Scott and I have been talking quite a bit about that fact, that there's this um, traditional sort of disconnect between the technologies that much of many of you are uh, very well versed in and the traditional technologies of Microsoft. Can you tell us a little bit about the thought process of the organization and your world in particular? What, what does it mean to us and why is it important that you're here? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, it's uh, one of the things that, that happened uh, in July. Billy joined me at a Microsoft event, which is our big worldwide partner conference. And we kind of talked about the same question, which is, gosh, why is he here? And uh, you know, I think part of it is really uh, openly representative of the kind of new type of Microsoft that we're really looking to build, which is one where how do we put customers really at the center of everything that we do uh, and then work back and figure out how do we best meet their needs and how do we enable them to transform their businesses, build great applications, uh, and really leverage the cloud in order to transform everything that they do. And that means you know, enabling them to use every technology. And so we love Windows, but we love Linux. Uh, that means we love open source. And not only are we looking to embrace open source and enable it to work uh, great with our platform, but how do we take even our core platform, things like ASP.NET and the .NET framework, and open source that as well uh, and contribute our own code into the ecosystem. And so, you know, that's a, that's a big change for us. And it, uh, uh, we're still early in the journey, but you know, hopefully opens up a whole bunch of possibilities and, you know, enables some great partnerships like the one we have with Datastax today. It is. Thank you. And, and the, the conference in Orlando was, was remarkable. And uh, Scott asked me at that event, well, what do you think about our partnership? And I said, I think it's improbable. Uh, five years ago, I don't think Microsoft and a company like Datastax would have had much uh, in common, but today it's, it's been actually really impressive. And when you talk about putting the, the customers, our audience, in, in the center, um, one of the things that, that I know we will hear in a lot of the sessions and you will hear from people as you talk, that there's a trend emerging because of the capabilities of Cassandra to do something that traditional databases and even some newer databases still can't do very well and that is this notion of multi-data center and the capability of having an active database in multiple locations. Well, from our perspective at Datastax, uh, our audience is moving very quickly into a hybrid environment where they're looking at their on-premise solutions and then also their cloud solutions. Do you see that same trend and what does it look like from, from your side of the fence? Yeah, I mean, I think every customer right now and every organization is really looking at how do you embrace the cloud in a pretty substantial way. And that journey is going to look different for different organizations. Um, you know, some have large existing on-premise investments uh, that are going to take years to depreciate or years to migrate. And you know, there's others that are startups and you know, don't have any existing legacy uh, and can move even faster. And you know, I think the thing that's important in that journey is how do you have the flexibility and the choice 
so that you can kind of make the decision on a workload by workload basis or an application by application basis in terms of how you leverage the cloud. And you know, I think where the, the vision that kind of we have at Microsoft and I think Datastax has that's very complementary is, is how do we have a set of technologies that can work both in the public cloud, uh, in a single data center or better yet, in multiple data centers all over the world, and can also integrate in an easy way with on-premises systems. Uh, and that ability to kind of interconnect those and have that type of hybrid story really enables maximum choice and enables you to build some fantastic solutions. So I, I know we've heard a lot from Microsoft about cloud first, mobile first. So that doesn't mean cloud only. It just means the way you guys think about the world, we have to enable this, this opportunity for customers. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we often talk about uh, is kind of core to our strategy is how do we enable a world where you can take advantage of hyperscale? where when you have a runaway hit application, you uh, can scale yeah. up to any amount of capacity where you can basically run your solution all over the world close to your customers yeah. so that you have the optimum performance uh, that can really both please them but also frankly drive your revenue. And then marry that hyperscale with an enterprise grade platform and then the hybrid capability to maintain maximum flexibility. And I think that combination of hyperscale, hybrid and enterprise grade ends up being super powerful and basically means you can go and tackle any type of scenario. So when you're having these very practical discussions with somebody and you go in and, and they have these uh, six data centers and they're trying to go through a data center rationalization project and they're trying to optimize for these things, are, are these some of the core topics that you find yourself engaging with the, at a strategic level with the, with the CIO or the VP of IT or, or people who are trying to figure this out? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're in the, the stage in the industry around cloud adoption where uh, certainly at the enterprise level, I'm, I'm now finding pretty much every enterprise is you know, grappling with these problems because they, they do require a lot of things to work out and figure out what does that journey look like. But I think it's something that every company is going to go through over the next 18 months to two years uh, and really start that journey. And so you know, it's, it's an exciting time, I think, to be in this industry and to be a developer. You know, one of the things that um, you and I were talking about offline, uh, because it is, it's a real joy to get to talk to Scott about um, the development world and how application architectures have changed. And I think when people talk about cloud, they automatically start to assume things like operational cost reduction. And, you know, don't need as much power, as much footprint, and I don't need the cost of administering all those machines. I think that's important. But again, when you have a database like Cassandra that starts to enable you to distribute the database in an active state, there's another really important element that I, that I know many of you really are, are trying to optimize for, and that's low local latency. Right? Great alliteration there, but low local latency is, is the key because with these apps being at this scale, the throughput becomes so important when that app is successful which sometimes is the worst cause of failure, unfortunately, as the app succeeds, it needs to scale, and then it falls over. So when you think about app design, not costs or not ease of that kind of administration, but application architecture design and low local latency, what would you say to this audience about, about that kind of aspect of Azure? Well, I think you know, it's, you know, one of the things that, uh, there's been a lot of studies on, which is you know, what is the cost of, say, 10 or 15 milliseconds of latency in your application? for a mobile or web-based solution to any customer, whether it's a consumer or an enterprise. And you know, basically, you know, for every millisecond you add, not only does it kind of drop CSAT, but in a retail organization, you'll see our, your sales will actually drop, and mm -hmm. everything you can shave out to get better performance usually translates and pays back, not just in terms of SAT, but really in terms of business results. And so you know, if you can have a platform that enables you to really shave off as much time as possible and make your app as snappy as possible, uh, you really have a, a winning solution. And so you know, the thing that we've focused on, for example, with Azure, is we now have uh, 19 uh, what we call data center regions around the world. Uh, put that in perspective, that's actually more than AWS and Google combined. Uh, and you know, they're literally all over the world, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, uh, Australia, Japan. Uh, we even have two regions in mainland China. Uh, we're the only cloud provider, uh, Western cloud provider that operates there. And so the beauty wow, is- so they're actually up and running in mainland China. Yeah, they're up and running in Beijing and Shanghai today. Wow. And so you can basically take uh, data stacks or Cassandra-based solution, and you can deploy them into one or all of those different data centers. And you get to choose where you want to run your code. And the beauty is, you know, if you want to reach the Australian market, 
you want to make sure your app is running in Australia. If you want to reach the South American market, you want to make sure your app is running in South America. And frankly, even if you want to reach the US market, you yeah. really want to run your app both East Coast and West Coast, and probably one or two places in between. And that ability to have kind of a cloud infrastructure that enables it, and then more importantly, the ability at the application level with Cassandra to enable that consistency model uh, really enables you to build much, much faster apps. And as you saw earlier, uh, enable even better reliability. I'm yeah. not going to let your employees in any of my data centers <laughs> no, going forward. Let, but Don't let them um, near your data centers. But, but it really enables you to build much better architectures and apps as well. That's great. Yeah, I, I do think that availability, we always think of availability as th this kind of dramatic outage. But in today's world, if an app is slow, it might as well be unavailable, not just for the CSAT and the bounce rates, but it will literally start to queue up to a state where it can't catch up anymore. And so the throughput has to be there and that low local latency is really important. Yep. Uh, so, so some closing thoughts. You have, um, we're all here and we get to benefit from some of your industry experience and you talk to global customers on a regular basis. One thing I love about Scott as an executive is uh, he really truly is uh, a person of the people. He is out a lot with customers. So if you were gonna pass on just a couple of nuggets of wisdom so that we don't bang our heads on the same maybe walls that, that others have before us. What would you leave us with? Well, I think if you're building apps in this uh, modern era, I mean, I think there's many lessons. I mean, if I had to pick three, I'd say on the really design for agility and think hard as you start building and scaling solutions, how do you have the flexibility and the agility to react? Because you're going to have different things, whether it's you know, a natural disaster or someone's gonna come into your office and say, look, I need this feature done quickly yeah. and I need to be able to scale around the world. And so having kind of an engineering system and a set of platform choices that give you that agility, I think is probably the most critical thing uh, in the cloud space. You know, I think the other one I'd say is have good monitoring because uh, it's one thing to be able to, to kind of know that you're reacting to a tornado. It's another thing to know that the tornado actually hit you. Yeah. And I'd say the number one thing for any online system that we typically run into is, gosh, I wish I had more monitoring data in place to understand what the problem was. And I think the third one is really just don't throw any data away. It's, it's amazing how much value you can extract from the data that you're already storing inside your applications. You, know, you saw the, 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 the demo uh, a little bit earlier in terms of how can you apply Spark and Solar and others to data. Yeah. Um, but I'd say, you know, in general, that's something that, that you can really find and extract just huge amounts of value from that data. Don't throw it away. Find a way to use it. Yeah, very different mindset from how we thought just even five years ago and, and certainly 10 years ago on how to build these apps. So thank you very much for that wisdom, Scott. But we did something with the video, Killer Videos demo that was a big jump. And that is we just assumed that the infrastructure was in place when, when we began. Uh, we've just announced uh, some more about our strategic partnership together as Datastax and Microsoft, and part of that is the experience that we want you to feel when you're working with an Azure environment and when you're working with a, a Datastax cluster. So would you be willing today to actually show us what that will feel like um, in, real, in real time? Sure. Let's Great. Demo. Let's, let's come on over and get started. <clears throat> So what I have here is our Azure Management Console. So it's a, it's a browser-based experience. There's obviously REST APIs and command line utilities that you can use as well. Um, and basically, you can use it to kind of manage all of your different Azure services. Uh, and so we've got you know, hundreds of different services uh, across a wide spectrum that you can actually go ahead and use. And one of the things that we've done is also integrate as part of the experience what we call our marketplace, uh, which basically allows you to consume services from a whole bunch of our partners uh, and other um, solution providers. And you can see today is Datastax Day uh, on Azure. And so we actually have it as the featured item uh, in our marketplace gallery. Uh, you can learn all about it and then basically directly go ahead and create it uh, and create a new cluster inside Azure. Um, and what we've done is, is rather than just sort of say, here's a single VM, go deploy it, and then leave it as sort of an exercise to the reader in terms of how you scale that across a massive cluster is you know, worked with data stacks in terms of providing sort of an integrated experience that makes it trivially easy to stand up not only a dev test environment, but really a production environment that can run anywhere around the world. Uh, and so for example, let's just call this demo Scott and Billy. I'm gonna give it a username, password here. 
I can basically, we'll call it uh, Scott demo. It's the first time I did it. Um, and then basically I can choose where I want to run this around the world. As I mentioned, we got 19 regions open for business today. You can basically just click any of them from this list. We'll just do it in the West US. And so that's the regionality up. option. Where that's we can, the regionality. We can pick any yep. of those are all available. And basically then I'm just going to hit OK. <clears throat> and then you'll notice what we've done is sort of integrated in the data stacks specific settings as well into the experience. And so, you know, as I mentioned, you could do a single VM, but be more impressive, you could do, let's say, 90 node Cassandra cluster, uh, where we'll basically install it and coordinate it. It's as simple as pulling it from the dropdown list. I can choose the size of machines I want to run. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our largest VMs can do a half a terabyte of RAM, seven terabytes of local SSD storage, which is a pretty screaming fast if you've got 90 of those deployed around the world. Uh, and then basically, I can just go ahead and enter in my data stacks username and password, which is the hardest part of the demo, because I have to remember what If it I is. get that email address, he's going to get 7,000 emails <laughs> right after this conference. Basically, you hit OK. You'll see the summary. We click OK. And then basically, just confirm it. If you don't have a license, you can actually buy it and transact it uh, directly as part of this experience. Click Buy. And we're now deploying a 90 node. Cassandra data stacks cluster in the western half of the US. This will take a few minutes, and then at which point I've got a fully working system up and running. You know, here's one I deployed in East Asia um, uh, yesterday. And you can see basically here are all the nodes that are now running. Uh, if I want to drill into any of these uh, directly in the Azure Management Console, you can see I can actually do that. Uh, and so I can see all the settings, the network settings. Uh, it's pulling out CPU percentage directly from Asia. And you can see, going back to the, you know, how much we love Linux, we've even integrated directly the Linux serial console output uh, directly in the management portal. And so you can see here, this is actually what the boot sequence looked like on that Cassandra node. And you can see basically all the way from the OS all the way down into the Cassandra boot sequence exactly what happened as part of that. Uh, everything, again, you can do here, you can fully automate. And this is all right now, we're still in the, the browser-based Azure console. Yep, this so is I can get down to this level of node information right from one place. All in one place, full role-based access control, everything's set up. You know, this, this we showed this 90 node cluster we're deploying. We're even gonna, we're working on a template uh, that I found out actually after rehearsal yesterday, which will also now allow you to deploy in multiple regions simultaneously and set up a virtual private network automatically. Perfect. The same sort of two minutes the wow factor that you saw here. And then basically, you know, the beauty is you can use all the data stacks tools against this. So here's that 90 node cluster up and running. Uh, I can and this go is ahead. our, this is data stacks op center that we're looking at now. Exactly. This is the data stacks op center. You can see the dashboard in terms of the health of this killer video application. Uh, and that is the killer video application now deployed, running in Azure, scaled out across 90 nodes anywhere in the world. Wow. That is fantastic. Scott, Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Scott Guthrie. <clears throat>If you guys are interested in more of that Killer Videos application and you want to dive deep into the data model or how the code was constructed or the queries that were used, uh, in the Partner Pavilion area, you can find our Meet the Expert Centers, and they will help you go very deep under the hood of that application if you'd like. So uh, thank you very much also to our engineering teams. One of the things that has made this a, a great partnership is we've got executive alignment between Scott and me. We've got uh, technical alignment with the engineering teams that allow this amazing stuff to happen. And then we've got field alignment where you hopefully feel a single experience if you're working with, with both of our customers. So um, thank you again, Scott, for, for all that help. Next up, I would like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Ellis. I have had the privilege of working with Jonathan now for over four years at Datastax. Jonathan was one of the founders along with Matt File. And Jonathan is a, a, a pretty special person. Uh, I continue to be impressed more each year of getting to know him. And not just for the benefits that he brings to the technical world on the Cassandra side. Him and his team do amazing things. He and his team do amazing things. Tell my daughters use the right pronoun. But they are also so passionate about every one of you. They really want the community experience to be phenomenal. And they've done so much work to that end. So I would like, without further ado, to have you help me welcome on stage the Apache Cassandra Chairman, Mr. Jonathan Ellis.
Thank you, Billy. I'd also like to thank Scott and the evangelists for those fantastic demos. I would like to be the third person to get on stage here and tell you to check out that killer video application and see how easy it is to build a modern application with Apache Cassandra and Datastax Enterprise. We've put a lot of effort at Datastax over the last couple years to bring you a first class experience in building those applications with our Cassandra drivers. And you'll be pleasantly surprised at how easy it is and how productive you are in that environment. What I'd like to do for the rest of my time today is give you a vision of where the database industry is headed, both at a high level in terms of the entire operational database segment, and also at a low level in what Apache Cassandra specifically is doing. You probably noticed over this past weekend that there was an outage in the Amazon US East data center. This is the kind of challenge that modern applications need to be able to cope with. And they need a new generation of infrastructure that's designed to handle this kind of event. That's why in 2013, Gartner recognized this and replaced their OLTP uh, database report with one covering a broader category of all operational databases, including next generation technology like Cassandra. And if you're eBay or Instagram or Salesforce and you're looking to build a new application or extend an existing one, you, you're going to want to do that on the best technology in the industry. You're going to want to do that on Cassandra. Now, for me, when, when I'm thinking about a, a category, it helps to have specific examples to help me wrap my mind around, around that. And so in the database industry, I like to think of databases along two axes. And on the top here, we have the operational category. That's where you run your business, as opposed to the analytical category on the bottom, which is where you run reports against what happened in your business. And so in the upper left, we have the Oracle and SQL Server uh, operational systems. And in the upper right, you have the next generation operational systems like Cassandra. And people ask me, well, what's the difference between you know, this uh, you know, technology from the 90s and Oracle and SQL Server and so forth and uh, you know, Apache Cassandra? What makes it different and better suited to modern web, mobile, and IoT applications? And there's, there's three key properties of a modern operational database that Cassandra does better than anyone in the industry. Those are the, the ability to be always on, and the ability to scale, and the capacity to deliver high performance. So I want to take a couple minutes and talk about each of these in turn. When Web 1.0 hit in the late, late 90s, that, that was the, the first beginning of a change in customers' expectations. Google launched or, or started their company in 1998, and a lot of people in the room have been using Google almost as long as they've been alive. And every time you go to that uh, Google.com, you expect to get that search box back. You know, it would be unthinkable to go to Google and get back a page that says, we're down for planned maintenance, come back at 6 AM. It, it's just unthinkable. And the 10 years after Google was started, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. And this same expectation of, availability started propagating to the mobile world. And today, mobile is the dominant player in markets bigger than desktop in a lot of places. And the, the problem with, with this new world of needing to, to design for scale and availability is that the obvious way to do it is wrong. And I'll give you an example. You know, if, if you're building your application in the 90s and you have your, your uh, application server talking to the database, you know, everything is nice and simple and, and you're, you're in a happy place. But then you start outgrowing the capacity of that single database server to handle your workload. 
And so you think, OK, well, I, I can just take that single machine and I can shard my data across multiple machines. And then I, I, I need some kind of uh, uh, fault redundancy, so I'll replicate those masters to a couple slaves so I have the ability to fail over. And I'll, I need to put a routing service in front of this so that when my client comes along with an update now, I can uh, be told which shard owns my data, and I can send that to the master, and the master sends it to the slaves, and, and everything works. And, and everything does work as long as nobody goes down. So this is, this is kind of where the industry was circa 2002. And you know, it, that's where we were, but we know, we know better now. Because this design has some built-in limitations. One of those is that even if the software is working perfectly, if I lose a master, I can't do anything with the data in that shard until I have a failover and I elect a new master and bring that online. And then I can start accepting requests against that data again. So I've got, I've got this built-in period of downtime if that master goes down. But there's also another property with, of this, which is perhaps even more scary, which is that the architecture is brittle. So for instance, if I have, instead of my machine going down, all my machines are alive, but I have a network partition and a switch fails, and now some of the machines, the machines on the lower left here, uh, can talk to each other, but they can't talk to the machines in the upper right, and vice versa. And so what will happen if you're not careful is each of those halves uh, of, of your network will elect masters and start accepting requests. And so this is, this is called a split brain scenario. And when, when you have multiple masters accepting uh, updates for a given partition, then you're going to introduce corruption. And th this isn't just a theoretical problem. Armin Ronecker gave a, a talk a couple years ago about how this exact problem happened to his MongoDB cluster. And the, the architecture that I've shown you is basically a simplified version of how MongoDB works. And uh, Armin described how there was a network partition and MongoDB got confused, there were multiple masters elected, and, and he had a corruption in his database. This is how MongoDB has achieved the industry-leading reputation that it has today. <laughs> By contrast, Cassandra manages your data without any master-slave replication set up. Each replica in a master in a Cassandra cluster can handle your updates independently of the others. So even if two of those replicas are down, it's no problem. I don't need to take any heroic failover events. Cassandra keeps on working because it's designed to tolerate that kind of failure. Now, it's true that, that in an extreme situation, like you have Patrick and Rachel destroying every node in your, in your cluster, that uh, Cassandra, Cassandra can't deal with that. Um, but in a more realistic scenario, this kind of design can mitigate real world failures. So the, the kind of the best Petri dish for uh, you know, infrastructure failure may be Amazon Web Services. And I say that not, not to throw stones at Amazon because you know, they're, they're the best in the business at this. Uh, but even though they have so much experience and so much expertise, you still have a, um, roughly one major outage a year. Uh, it's, almost, it's almost uncanny how, th how that happens like clockwork. And so what I take away from this is that you know, even if you are the best in the business, then you do need to plan for that kind of outage because it's going to happen. So in, in 2011, uh, EBS took down US East, uh, EBS again, uh, ELB, bad network hardware, uh, reboot apocalypse, and then most recently uh, DynamoDB metadata service. So you know, Cassandra can, can help you deal with these. Christos from Netflix described how during last year's uh, reboot scenario, where 10% of all the, all the VMs in Amazon were rebooted, uh, they lost over 200 uh, Cassandra machines. Over 20 of those didn't come back at all. And there was zero downtime. 
And by the way, Christos is here at the conference. He'll be here tomorrow. And uh, give, at his talk, one of the things he'll discuss is how Cassandra helped mitigate uh, the most recent downtime. The next thing I, I want to talk about is scale. And it, it's absolutely critical to be able to scale to the largest workloads in the industry. Apple was here last year talking about their 75,000 Cassandra nodes. But it's arguably even more important to be able to scale as your business grows. And ProtectWise is a good example of that. Now, they, they started two years ago with a three-node Cassandra cluster. Today, they're at 300 Cassandra nodes. So Cassandra has grown with their business by two orders of magnitude and, and made that happen smoothly and seamlessly. Another factor uh, having to do with scale is being able to scale geographically. So here I, I've diagrammed a Cassandra cluster that spans New York and London data centers. And I've put eight nodes in London, uh, in New York, and five in London, and I've done that deliberately. Because one of the things that Cassandra gives you is an unprecedented degree of flexibility about how you configure this. So it's, it's totally comfortable with having an asymmetrical uh, configuration where you have different numbers of nodes in different regions to handle different amounts of capacity requirements. And I can have three replicas in New York and two in London. And, it, and I can configure it at that level of granularity as well. This is important because to deliver the kinds of availability that modern applications need, you, you need to have the ability to scale across regions in case you have a, a regional failure. So these, these, ca these properties of operational databases, they tie together. So it, it, when everything is going well, and you have Cassandra replicating to multiple regions, and uh, you can geolocate your users and send them to the closest region for the fastest possible response time. That's nice. That's nice to have that, that the ability to do that. But this is really critical when things don't go well and you lose one of the regions. And now, I don't need, again, I don't need to do any failover events inside Cassandra. All I need to do is push out a DNS update, for instance, out to my users that say, you know, go, go to this region instead. You know, no matter where you're based uh, globally, go to this region because it's still up. And Cassandra lets you do that. Finally, I, I want to talk about performance. And again, there's, there's kind of a, a right way and a wrong way uh, to build uh, a database to deliver maximum performance. And the wrong way is to, is to build it on top of an abstraction layer uh, that, that keeps you from taking advantage of what your modern hardware has to offer. So this is a diagram of uh, the Hadoop file system, HDFS. And, uh, the details aren't super important so much as that HDFS is designed for moving large replicas of data at once. So the, the block size in HDFS is 64 megabytes. HDFS is kind of an 18-wheeler of big data, where it's designed to, you put a lot of boxes in it, and it ships those all to the same place, doesn't accelerate particularly quickly, but it's very cost-effective and efficient at, at moving large amounts from one place to another. That's what it's designed for. Uh, the problem is when you take this, this file system that's designed for an analytical workload and you try to build an operational database on top of it, then you run into problems. And, and that's what uh, HBase has done. And that, that's why they have, uh, have those problems. A group of researchers presented a paper at the Usenix conference last November where they examined production failures in HBase and in Cassandra. And Murad Demirbas from SUNY Buffalo summarized this as saying, it seems like HBase is very buggy with 50% of failures being catastrophic, where a catastrophic failure means that either my data uh, wasn't available because the, mission, the, the cluster went down, or it lost data permanently. And this comes from the brittleness of that master-slave design architecture that I talked about earlier. By contrast, Cassandra manages its storage locally and manages its replication natively to get the best possible performance out of your hardware. 
So we can build on the blocks that the operating system gives us, like IMMAP and like FAdvise, to pull data into memory when we need it most and give you the best possible performance. Datastax contracted with a company called Endpoint earlier this year to benchmark the top NoSQL systems, where you have Cassandra and Couchbase and HBase and MongoDB. And if you ask someone uh, who was you know, kind of familiar with the industry and said, what workload would Cassandra be most appropriate for? He'd probably tell you it would be a write-heavy workload. So that's what we've got in, in this first graph, where I have operations per second on the y-axis, and this is a 90% writes workload. Across the x-axis, what you see is going from uh, a two-node cluster and doubling uh, the cluster up to an eight-node cluster. And again, Cassandra in blue uh, doing very well against its uh, industry peers. But you might be surprised then to, to look at the read-dominated read workload, and Cassandra's actually doing even better, relatively speaking, in this workload. So Cassandra is really a general purpose system that can handle a wide variety of workloads. This is the, the balanced workload where we're doing 50% reads, 50% writes, and you can see that some of Cassandra's competition has uh, trouble with the uh, uh, competition between those reads and those writes, that they're conflicting with each other and reducing performance. And then finally, we did want to recognize that you know, even operational databases will need to do some light analytics as part of your application workflow, uh, such as the, the machine learning that Luke and John showed us uh, with Spark against the killer video demo. So now that, now that you understand what, what Cassandra's designing for around uh, performance and around scale and around availability, I want to talk about what we've been working on in Apache Cassandra uh, 2.2 and 3.0 to make Cassandra even better uh, at these characteristics. Now, a, a year ago at the summit, I talked about Cassandra 2.1. And at the time, we were planning to go from 2.1 straight to 3.0 and deliver you know, a traditional uh, big release full of features uh, in 3.0. But what we found that was that um, we, we were introducing a new storage engine in 3.0, but not all of the features that we were planning depended on that storage engine. In fact, most of them didn't. So we, we split it up into two releases, and we said, we're going to try to get people the new features as fast as possible, so we're going to split out those features that don't depend on the new e uh, engine into 2.2. And then the features that do depend on the new engine uh, engine, those are going to be in 3.0 a little bit later. So 3.0 is uh, in release candidate now. We released that on Monday. We expect it to be generally available in October. 2.2 was released back in July. So that's, that's you know, everything here is, is available for you to test and, and play with. So the first feature I want to talk about in uh, 2.2 is JSON support. Now, you know that, that Cassandra thinks about the world in terms of rows and columns, and I, I can have a table that looks like this, and I can insert data into it with a CQL statement like this. Starting with 2.2, I can do all of this in JSON as well. So the syntax for that says, insert into table name JSON, and then I give it a JSON document literal, and Cassandra will parse that and transform it into its native representation. This is designed to allow Cassandra to seamlessly integrate into a world of JSON-based microservices. So there's actually a subtle difference in the two statements that I gave here. And you, you'll notice that in the CQL statement, I generate my uh, user ID with the built-in function now that creates a, a time-based UUID. Whereas in the JSON example, I'm giving it a UUID literal. And that's deliberate, because we, in, the, in the JSON world, the idea is I'm consuming data from another service rather than, rather than generating it uh, myself. If I'm generating the data myself, it's probably a better idea uh, to stick with CQL, uh, but you do have that choice. Uh, CQL allows you to nest 
data structures in, in your Cassandra rows, and we can expose those to JSON as well. So we introduced collections back in Cassandra 1.2. Uh, here's a table that has a tuple, a set, and a list uh, column types here. And so I can insert into that uh, table with CQL like this. And note that my tuple is represented with parentheses around the values. The set has curly braces, and the list has square brackets. So I have different uh, representations of each of those literals in CQL. So in JSON, uh, I only have a single kind of sequence literal. And so that's, that's the, the list literal in the square brackets. And so if, if you give me uh, a JSON value, and, I'm, and I know that under the hood in Cassandra, it's a tuple or a set, I can coerce that JSON list and transform it into the appropriate Cassandra type. The other way to nest data inside Cassandra is with user-defined types. And a, a simple user-defined type looks like this, where I have an address, a street number, and street name. And then I'll, I can use that in my table definition and say I have a, a street address column that is an address value. And then I can insert into that with CQL and then with JSON as well. So a user-defined type becomes a sub-document in the JSON uh, world. And we can take this further. We can nest things arbitrarily deeply in a Cassandra table and expose those to JSON. And the reason you'd want to do this is you want, you want to denormalize the data that your application needs for a request into a single Cassandra row. So you're not having to join data from different machines together in a given request. Nesting data into a Cassandra table makes that easier. So let's take a slightly more complicated address definition where now I have a set of phone numbers associated with, with each address. And then I'm gonna let users have multiple addresses. Now my users can have a home address and a work address, and we'll just let you supply any kind of address you want. You give me a text key and then an address value that it maps to. And so exposing that to JSON looks like this now, where I have the ID and the name literals at the top, and then the addresses collection becomes a sub-document, and my home address becomes another sub-document inside that. So again, what this does is it lets me build uh, modern microservice-oriented uh, architectures and play with those with Cassandra in a frictionless manner. I'm, making, I'm, I'm reducing the obstacles to being, being able to build those applications. We've also added in Cassandra 2.2, we've added Windows support. And I announced at the summit last year that 2.1 was kind of an extended beta for Windows. Now in 2.2, it's, it's production ready. And it's a first class citizen. We expect it to be on a level playing field with our Linux support. We've also added support for role-based authorization. And what this is intended for is for larger enterprises that are managing multiple members of a team we, we'd want to avoid the problem where, through human error, some members of the team have different permissions than the others. So you can create an accounting role, you can assign permissions to that role, and you can assign users to that permission, and Cassandra makes sure that that all stays in sync. So as you add users and remove users from your accounting team, all you need to do is uh, add and, and uh, unassign that role, and, and that possibility of a mismatch permissions goes away. We've also added user-defined functions. And the idea here is we want you to be able to push logic closer to the data in the Cassandra cluster. So as a very simple example, uh, this is how you would define uh, a sign function that computes the mathematical sign uh, in Java in Cassandra. So you say, you know, create function, you give it the parameter list, you give it the language name, and then you give it the function body, and that's all there is to it. Out of the box, we support Java and we support JavaScript, but we support integrating with any JavaScripting API compatible language. So if you want to write functions in Ruby, you just drop the JRuby jar in your class path and, and you can uh, create functions in Ruby and Cassandra. So 
So I can invoke this function like this in my select statement, where I'm invoking the, the function on a column called value. And you may be thinking that you know, this actually doesn't look terribly useful, because whether I compute the sign in the Cassandra cluster or whether I compute the sign in my application code, that doesn't really matter uh, a, great a great deal, because I'm pulling the same amount of data back to, back to my application server either way. And, and you're right. So the, the more important thing that, that these user-defined functions enable is the ability to compute aggregates at the server side. And an aggregate's a little more complicated, because I need to define uh, an intermediate state function that accumulates values uh, that are being processed. And then I need to define a final function that uh, gives me the final value from that intermediate state. So for my average function, I'm going, to, I'm going to have an intermediate average state, and that looks like this. And all this is doing, this is, this is saying that as values are, are fed in to my averaging function, I'm going to increment uh, a count of values that I've, that I've aggregated, and I'm going to increase the running total by the value that, that I just saw. That, that's what this says. And then my final state function is going to take the running total and divide it by the count to get the final value. So now this is, this is a lot more useful because I can combine thousands of values at the server and, and compute the average without having to leave the server, and then I can just send the average that the client wanted back to him, and that's much more efficient now, much more efficient use of, of network resources. Finally, for, for 2.2, we added commit log compression. You'll remember that for 2.1, we did a lot of effort on our performance for CQL reads and writes, but we were starting to be bottlenecked by commit log performance and by, by the amount of data we could push to a single disk. And so we've alleviated that bottleneck in 2.2. So you can see in green, uh, Cassandra 2.1 performance, uh, 2.2 in blue is about 10% faster. But not only is it about 10% faster, but you can see that there's there are, there are kind of spikes in the 2.1 graph where it has to pause briefly for the commit log to catch up. And those, those pauses have been eliminated in 2.2. So it's not only faster overall, but it gives you more consistent performance. Commit log compression is kind of experimental in 2.2. It's off by default, uh, but it's going to be turned on by default in 3.0. And I encourage you to, to play with that. You can turn it on on a single machine, uh, make sure everything's still stable, and then roll it out to the rest of your cluster. Finally, uh, date tiered compaction strategy is a new compaction strategy that we created during the 2.2 timeframe, but it's not actually limited to 2.2. Because we designed compaction strategies to be pluggable, we were ab actually able to take this back to 2.1 and even 2.0 without risking the stability of the system. So I'm going to, look, I'm going to show you two graphs that illustrate date-tiered compaction uh, performance. And what this is designed for, it's designed to handle dense time series workloads and allow you to pile a lot of data, even cold data, on a single box. So what, I, what I've done in this workload is I've actually pushed out all the way to 18 terabytes of data on a single machine. And so this, this graph here, this is the read performance. So I've put leveled compaction at the bottom, size tiered compaction in the middle, date tiered compaction at the top. And you can see you know, how, how each of those compaction strategies compares across, across this data set. Leveled compaction, as you're probably not too surprised to find out, falls off a cliff at about two and a half terabytes of data. And you're probably not surprised because level compaction is designed for read mostly workloads. This one is 90% writes. So it, it, it's very write intensive. And you, you also see on this graph that on the reads, date tiered is outperforming size tiered. And you're probably not surprised by that either because size tiered is designed to give you better write performance. So let's look at the, at the write side of this workload. And now that this is, this is probably a little more surprising, that even on writes, date-tiered compaction is outperforming size-tiered. 
because it can take advantage of what it knows about time series data to avoid unnecessary disk activity and wasting that I.O. on data that doesn't need to be compacted together. So that's what's, that's what's coming in 2.2. We have a lot of new features across the board. I mentioned earlier that, that we pulled out into 3.0, we pulled the new storage engine into there. And that touches everything in the system, and it enables new features that we couldn't do with our old engine. Our old engine, uh, you know, it's, it's served us well, but fundamentally, at the atomic level, it thinks of data in key value pairs. And so to deliver features like materialized views, we needed an engine that, that understands CQL semantics at a, at a more fundamental level. But even without those new features, there's one important benefit you get from the new storage engine, which is that it's much more space efficient. And how much more space efficient depends on your workload. And it, it depends dramatically. It can go from saving you 50% on one of these workloads to 70% on another. Uh, what I can give you as a rule of thumb is that data models with a large number of collating columns are going to save more space in 3.0 because that's one of the places where we're able to pull redundant information out and store it in just a single location. Another improvement we've made in uh, 3.0 was around hinted handoffs. So I, sh I showed you earlier that in a Cassandra cluster, I can have any node route the request to any replica, and if something goes wrong, we don't need to, take, we don't need to panic. It's designed to handle that. One of the ways it's designed to handle that is, is with something called hinted handoff, where if, if any replica doesn't acknowledge an update for whatever reason, uh, the coordinator will write what's called a hint to itself that says once that node comes back online or I'm able to talk to him again, we'll send that, uh, that missed update over. And, and delivering that hint is called handoff, so that's where the, the feature name comes from. The, the problem with hinted handoff has been that we've stored the hint data in a Cassandra system table. And so that looks like this, where when I write the hint, it goes first to the commit log, then we sort it in a mem table, and finally we write it to disk. And then when we delete the hint after we successfully deliver it, that uh, deletion creates a tombstone in the commit log, in the mem table, and on disk again. And we're still not done, because right now in this, in this picture, I have the original hint in one data file, and the tombstone that says it's deleted in another. So I actually need to compact those together to uh, reclaim that disk space. And so you know, this, this, there's a lot of overhead in this design that doesn't actually help us in, in hint delivery. Because we don't care about indexing hints by their ID or random access to, to different hints that Cassandra's storage engine is designed to provide. All we care about is, uh, store a hint safely, and then bulk deliver them. So for 3.0, we, we created a very simple custom storage engine for hints. And it just looks like this, where I'm going to create a flat file for when a, when a replica doesn't acknowledge my update, and I'll just append hints to that file, and I'll do that for every replica in the cluster that I need to store hints for. And then when the replica comes back online and I deliver those hints, I just delete the entire file at once. So it's very, very lightweight because it doesn't need the extra indexing that's going on in, in uh, the main Cassandra storage engine. So the performance difference that, that you can get out of this, um, it varies widely based on your cluster size. So I have here the most extreme possible example where I have a two-node cluster, and one of the nodes is down, and I'm writing hints for it to the other. And this is extreme because as my cluster size grows, the responsibility for storing hints for a dead node gets spread across all the nodes in a cluster. So in a 10-node cluster, you'd expect the difference to be about 10% you know, as large. But in, in this extreme example, 3.0 is about twice as fast as 2.2 as in this degraded situation. And this, this comes back to what I said earlier about how we want Cassandra to be able to scale down as well as scale up. And this is one of the features that is more meaningful uh, to smaller Cassandra clusters, because those are important too. 
Finally, I said that the, the new Cassandra storage engine allows us to build materialized views for the first time. What that looks like is, suppose I'm uh, collecting songs in my application, and each song has an album associated with it. And I want to ask Cassandra what songs belong to a given album. So with materialized views, I can create the view and say select star from songs, and the, my primary key now is going to be not just the ID, but first the album and then the ID. And by doing that, that, that tells Cassandra to partition the data by the album. And so now I can go and I can say select star from songs by album for a given album, and Cassandra can get me that song list. And you're probably thinking, this sounds a lot like indexes. And functionally, they're very similar. I can take my songs table, I can create an index on the album, and I can select from the table using that index. Uh, so it's functionally very similar. The difference is that indexes are managed locally. Each node in the cluster indexes the data that it owns. So what that means is when I go and I ask an index what songs are in this album, Cassandra has to scatter that query across the entire cluster. And then each node can look up in its local index, oh, do I have any songs in this album? And then we gather back those responses and feed them to the client. So as a consequence of this, if I go from my six node cluster here and I'm doing 10,000 requests per second, and I go up to a 60 node cluster, then I'm still gonna be pushing around 10,000 nodes per second because the bottleneck has become the scatter and the gather parts of the operation. By contrast, a materialized view, since Cassandra is repartitioning that data in your view, I only have to go to a single replica. I can go to the replica that owns the partition for the Tres Hombres album, and I can get all the songs back from that one, uh, one, from that one replica. So now when I go from a six node cluster to a 60, then I expect my performance to go from 10,000 per second to 100,000. Now the, the read performance of a materialized view is absolutely identical to the read performance from a normal table. It, it's the exact same code path, managed the exact same way. But I want to give you some idea of what to expect from the write performance in your cluster as you introduce materialized views to it. So we're gonna look at that a couple ways. The first way is to, you know, let's, let's take the writing to a table without any materialized views in, uh, at the top here in purple, and then in the red line I have a single materialized view that I've added, and then in the uh, purple at the bottom I've got five materialized views. So you, the rule of thumb is that adding a materialized view to your table will cost about 10% of your performance. And this is done just with the, the standard uh, Cassandra stress tool. But we also wanted to look at this a slightly different way and say, you know, given that I need to denormalize this data for my application, I either need to do that you know, the old fashioned way by uh, batching up those updates to tables that I'm maintaining by hand in my application code, or I can have Cassandra do that with a materialized view. So to, to compare those two approaches, we created a custom benchmark tool called MVBench, and this is what our performance looks like uh, for four materialized views against a base table of playlist data. So the materialized views are delivering 50 to 80% better performance than doing it manually, which is good because not only is it more convenient, by pushing that logic to the server, I can deliver very uh, better performance. But you'll notice one thing uh, of, with this materialized view line, which is that it looks like it's trending downwards over time. And that's not an accident of, of the benchmark. That's actually, that's actually caused by something real going on under the hood. And what's happening here is that in my base table of playlists here, as I'm inserting more and more data into, into each of those playlists, I'm increasing the time I spend in lock contention against the base table because materialized view maintenance needs to take out exclusive locks against the base table to keep the views consistent with the base table data. And so uh, as a rule of thumb, that, that contention starts to become meaningful at about uh, 200 rows 
uh, per partition. Fortunately, most uh, tables that you'd want to denormalize with materialized views uh, have small partitions. But this is something that you're going to want to keep in mind as, as you uh, incorporate materialized views into your data model. So we've talked about uh, what's here in 2.2, what's coming up in 3.0. I, I want to take a, just a, a couple minutes to talk about what's coming after 3.0. And in particular, what we're doing to make uh, Cassandra uh, delivering features to you on a more regular basis and with even better stability. And so you saw, you saw a little bit of, what, of our telegraphed approach when we split 2.2 off of 3.0 because smaller releases you know, ship faster and they're more stable. And so we want to take that even farther. We're going to start doing monthly Cassandra releases to give you uh, more features and better stability. And we're, we, we didn't just want to jump to doing monthly releases because you know, that would be a good, re, a good way to let our feature development get ahead of us and, and cause problems. So we looked to Intel's TikTok development process for inspiration. And what Intel does is they split their, their microprocessor development into a tick of smaller transistors and new manufacturing process and a talk of a new microarchitecture. And so by splitting those up, they reduce uh, the possibilities for error and the possibilities for conflicts, and you get a more reliable schedule. So the way we're applying that to Cassandra is that every other monthly release will be a pause in feature development and just include bug fixes. So uh, 3.0, we expect in late October, we'll begin the TikTok releases at the beginning of December with 3.1, which will be just bug fixes. Then 3.2 in January will include new features. 3.3 will be just bug fixes, and so forth. Now, if, if you're paying attention to the industry recently, Intel has actually had some hiccups in their TikTok process. And we're realistic enough to acknowledge that we'll probably have some hiccups as we move to this development process as well. So what we're doing is, in parallel with the TikTok process, we're going to continue to deliver traditional stabilization releases of the 3.0 line. So we'll release 3.0.1, 3.0.2, and so forth, and each of those will not include any new features at all, but strictly contain bug fixes. The other thing that people ask me about when I describe the TikTok uh, process is, well, what about compatibility? And the, the answer is that uh, we're going to be 100% compatible across the entire 3.x TikTok line. And at some point, probably in about a year, we'll introduce 4.x, and we'll, that will be our line at which we sunset deprecated features and so forth. But for that entire 3.x series, it's going to be 100% compatible. I hope you're as excited as I am about the new features in Cassandra 2.2 and what's coming in 3.0 and the new development process that will allow us to continue delivering new features at a regular cadence and keep Cassandra the best operational database in the industry for years to come. This is important because you're not building applications from 20 years ago. You're building 21st century applications, and you need the power of a 21st century database behind that. Now to explain what Datastax is doing to help train the world to use the power of Apache Cassandra, I'd like to bring Billy back on stage. Jonathan, before you head off, I want to uh, get some help from you here. Make sure I got this right. I'm gonna roll this out. You grab that end. And let's see what we're looking at here. Don't burn my fingers, you're cutting me here. Walk back so I don't fall off the stage. All right, what we have here is signatures from our inaugural certification process for Apache Cassandra, sponsored by O'Reilly. So big congratulations. 
to everybody on the list. And we will make that available for everybody down in the, uh, in the partner pavilion area. Jonathan, thank you so much for all of your uh, effort and time. So, a lot of deep stuff there, right? Jonathan is nothing if not thorough, and we will always get a good look at what's going on with the technology and the uh, inner bowels of the systems and how they work, and that's one great thing about being in the open source community, but that does lead to a challenge that is vitally important that we help you solve, and that is the ecosystem itself. How fast can we get the ecosystem up to speed on how to use and take advantage of these great new features? And so our training program that we ran yesterday was far, far more successful than we had anticipated. We had planned for 600 people. That was our capacity. We started to try and push it to 650 because we had a lot of inbound demand. Then we tried seven. We ended up, I don't know how, we put 737 people through the training yesterday that was uh, done with a partnership with O'Reilly for the certification. That is the kind of thing that is going to take now this technology and once again put another accelerant on it so that you can take this knowledge and start to apply it in very meaningful ways. Not everybody in here is going to need to know how hints are handled at that level. But what you will need to know is how to build a fantastic data model to support your application. And you will need to know the basics of how you get your data in and out of the system. So our training initiatives are gonna be centered around helping this world move much, much faster. So please take advantage of them. We have a lot of, of free offerings available online that you can come and get yourself trained at your own pace. But do it, do it right. Because when you do it right, you're helping yourself, you're helping your company, you're helping everybody see the value that you bring to the market by getting things like a, a certification. So let's learn how to do this stuff right out of the gate. It'll make everything go much faster. Next, I want to thank uh, a very special group of people. We got the opportunity to talk to uh, Microsoft with Scott and see what they're doing with us. But the partner pavilion, as I said earlier, is just off the charts this year. We've got, an, I know, well beyond 35 partners back there. And I, I know many of you were there this morning and already the room was getting packed. But just looking at our, our gold partnerships for a second is very representative of what's happening in the industry. And what you're seeing is market leaders, people that have had market dominant positions for decades are realizing we have to also get in this game, stay ahead, make sure we're leveraging all these new technologies. But you also see traditional market makers, companies that have combined created billions and billions and billions of dollars of value and created new markets. That is fantastic when you see that kind of endorsement from a traditional ecosystem come to an event like this. And then finally, there's a third classification of partners that you'll see, which is the startup crowd to build the next couple of decades of these giant companies that are gonna define our industry. So we really wanna thank them for all their effort, and I know you won't be disappointed when you go back and spend some time talking and seeing what they're all up to. But finally, and most importantly, it is really all about you. This is where we wanna thank you for everything that you've done for the time, the dedication, the passion, the energy that you're applying to learning this new market and this new technology. Everything I said last year about you being the authors of this new world is 100% true, but I believe it has risen by an order of magnitude. When I see what's happening now in the market, and when you go to these 137 sessions, and you listen to what's going on, and you realize this is in your control, this is your future. You get to write an entire industry. That doesn't happen very often, guys. It just doesn't happen very often. It can't. The ecosystem can't sustain that in anything other than a couple of decades at a time. So it is a real privilege to be able to stand here and thank you for your participation and to help you get accelerated and to help you get creative and get passionate about what you're doing. So thank you all very much, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Enjoy yourself.